Riches come when we live within our means, when we're not stretched, we're not paying interest on credit cards. You'll never ever get ahead that way. You've got to learn to live within your means. And that's what the text is saying. If I live for pleasure and I do whatever I have to do to keep up with the Joneses, it's just going to drown me. And I'll never be rich. I'll die poor. It's great to see you all. Thank you for coming back tonight. Um, so we were going to devote the month of March to money, and I've only had to preach twice, which is really good because it's something I'm really insecure about. <laughs> so, uh, so next week we'll jump into a new topic. Not really sure yet, either going to dive into work or uh, family. So what, what Proverbs says about one of those two topics. Um, but I did want to talk to you tonight. You can see the title on the screen or in your notes, How to Be Rich Financially. Now, that sounds like a horrible topic to preach in a church. Um, so I, wanna, I want to kind of give some prefaces before we jump into this. This is super basic stuff. You may find the sermon, to be quite frankly, a little bit boring. But um, it is, there is a lot of stuff in the book of Proverbs about money and about finances and about the difference between the rich and the poor, okay? And there are certain things that lead people to be poor, and there are certain things that lead people to be rich. So I think since the, since the Bible kind of points that out, I think it's good for us to walk through it. I, I titled the sermon very specifically, How to Be Rich Financially, because uh, that is just one part of us in the sense that um, I don't think this should be the goal in life, like I want to be rich financially, but I think there are some things that we can do to be rich financially. The most important thing that you need to be rich in is towards God, right? Because uh, So you want to be rich spiritually. And that's what the Bible, uh, you know, in, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, there's only one time where Jesus called somebody a fool. And he called somebody a fool in a parable that he told about a rich man that had a lot of stuff and he said, you know, what am I going to do? Well, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns. And remember, in the story then, um, the, God says to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. He, wasn't, he was prepared financially to die. He was not prepared spiritually to die. So he died a fool. So what does it, you know, in the end, what does it matter if you have all the money in the world and you die without Christ? Uh, you, you don't take the money with you, and you spend an eternity without God. So, so being rich in and of itself should not be the aim. But I do think it's, it's not wrong to be rich in any way. It's not money that is the root of all evil. It's the love of money, okay? Also, some of the people in the Bible that God used the greatest were the richest. Uh, you, you think of... You know, you think of the uh, patriarchs of, of Israel. You think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All very rich men. Abraham was very, very rich. Isaac was rich. Uh, Jacob was rich. Um, in the same way, David was a man who started out as a shepherd boy, but then became the leader of Israel and was, uh, had a lot of money. And in fact, Solomon was so rich because his dad was so good economically and with money and with trade and with how he handled his finances. So a lot of that is credited to David, Solomon kind of took it to another level. So the Bible is definitely not anti-money, and it's not anti-you making money or having money. You don't see that in Scripture. The problem is, is making it a priority. So I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't want you to get the wrong idea as we kind of walk through this topic tonight about how to be rich financially, but money is something that we all have to deal with. It, it's, it's something that's needed to pay the bills and to and to pay for the rent, or to pay the utilities, and we need money, we have to deal with money, so I think it's a good thing to look at uh, um, how, what the Bible says about in regard to money, and also think that money can become a tremendous area of stress in a lot of people's lives. You know, when you look at the four reasons, the four big reasons why people divorce, get divorces, one of those is often tied to money, okay? So, I think it's good to be rich in the sense that it's if, you've, if you have become rich the right way. And I guess I, I could title this a different message, How to Get Rich the Right Way and, and the Bible Way. Okay, so there are seven things that I want to pull out about uh, how to be rich financially. And the first one seems like a complete and utter contradiction. 
And that is the first step to being rich is to give. So number one, the first step to getting rich is to give. And there's a lot of verses. I Actually, there's four or five in the book of Proverbs that deal specifically with this subject. But I pulled out a couple of them for us that are in your notes and that as well are, as are up on the screen. Uh, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. We believe in tithing here. We believe in the principle of tithing. Um, when you get income, you then take 10% of that, the tithe, a tenth. You take 10% of that and you give it back to God. In a, in a way, acknowledging it, it is an act of worship. It is a way of saying, I couldn't have earned this without you, God, and I, I want to give 10% back to you, and I learned to live off the 90. The Bible says that if we honor the Lord with our possessions and with the first fruits of all our increase, then our barns will be filled with plenty and our vats will overthrow, overflow with new wine. Proverbs eleven twenty four says, There is one who scatters, yet increases more. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. So he's basically saying, you know, the, the, the mistake a lot of people make is they hoard. They hoard stuff. And, and uh, that often leads to poverty. So he goes, they're, they're withholding. They, they have opportunity to give. Uh, in the New Testament, it talks about that if, if we have the opportunity to give and we don't do it, we, we, we're, we're making a mistake. So, so he's talking here about um, give, basically give when it's in your power to give. So then, but then he says, the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Okay, so these two verses kind of make the implication that the way to gain is to give. So what do you do when you kind of want to research stuff? Well, you open Google and you type in, can I get rich by giving? Okay, which I did this week. I typed in, hey, can I get rich by giving? And it brought up an article from entrepreneur.com from 2006. Now, I'd love to really kind of give you a Reader's Digest version of this, but this, so this is not written from a Christian, and this is not written from a Christian, uh, a Bible view. This is written by a secular guy who is kind of talking about the research and talking about things that they've discovered. So it's about a five-minute read. Can I read it to you? And just it, it just just it's basically his argument about that giving makes uh, you richer. So he starts the article by referring to a great book. John Bunyan's 1684 classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, the character Old Honest poses this riddle to the innkeeper. He says, a man there was, though some did count him mad, the more he cast away, the more he had. Gaius solves the riddle, thus he, he says, he that bestows his goods upon the poor shall have as much again and ten times more. Less poetically, the idea is this, giving makes you rich. A lovely sentiment to be sure, but quite backward sounding to an economist. You obviously have to have money before you can give it away, right? Or in the pithy words of former Prime Minister, Minister Margaret Thatcher, no one would remember the Good Samaritan if he only had good intentions. He had money too. Well, it turns out that Gaius was right, and new economic research backs him up. Emerging evidence crunching statistics from real data, not the mushy self-help stuff, supports the contention that giving stimulates prosperity for both individuals and nation. Charity, it appears, can really make you rich. The United States is a remarkable charitable nation. The The Giving USA Foundation estimates that Americans donated nearly $300 billion to charity in 2006, more than the gross domestic product the, and the gross domestic product is the annualized value of goods and services produced within a nation of all but 33 countries in the world. More than three quarters of this came from private individuals. Additional research suggests that between 65 and 85 percent of Americans give to charities each year. How does all this generosity relate to our high average levels of prosperity? Let's begin with individuals and families. The social Capital Community Bench Survey, completed in 2000, is a survey of about 30,000 people in more than 40 communities across the United States and is is the best single source of data available on the civic participation of Americans. 
The SCCBS, which takes into account differences in education, age, race, religion, and other personal characteristics, shows that people who give charitably make significantly more money than those who don't. While that seems like common sense, it turns out that the link in the data between giving and earning is not just one way. People do give more when they become richer. Research has shown that a 10% increase in income stimulates giving by about 7%, but people also grow wealthier when they give. How do we know this? When two variables like giving and income are interrelated, economists use something called an instrumental variable to see which is pushing and which is pulling. In a nutshell, that means selecting something that's closely related to donations but not directly to income, like volunteering. Volunteers tend to be money givers and vice versa because of the same charitable impulse. But income doesn't always directly affect volunteering. While people have differing amounts of money, they all have the same amount of time. We start by predicting how much money people would donate based on how much they volunteer regardless of income. This projection essentially strips out the role of income in giving. Next, see if that predicted donation level correlates with income. If it does and the correlation is positive, it means that giving pushes up income and not vice versa. This is precisely what is found in the SCCBS data. More giving doesn't just correlate with higher income, it causes, it causes higher income, and not just a little. Imagine two families that are identical in size, age, race, education, religion, and politics. The only difference is that, is that this year, the first family gives away $100 more than the second. But based on my analysis of SCCBS's survey, the first family will, on average, earn 375 more as a result of its generosity. How can this be? It is a statistical anomaly or even metaphysical phenomenon. While the link between giving and prosperity is not as um, mechanistic as returns on multiple bonds, there are some very earthbound explanations for it. Psychologists and neuroscience have identified several ways that giving makes us more effective and successful. For example, new research from the University of Oregon finds that charity stimulates parts of the brain which are associated with meeting basic needs such as food and shelter, suggesting to the researcher that our brains know that giving is good for us. Experiments have also found that people are elevated by others into positions of leadership after they are witnessed behaving charitably. The financial advantages of giving aren't limited to individual givers. There is also evidence that donations push up income even more at the level of the entire nation's economy. We can demonstrate this by looking at the average household charity per capita GDP as they change over time. Charity and GDP levels have moved together over the years. Corrected for inflation and population changes, U.S. government data shows that GDP per person in America have risen over the past 50 years by about 150%. At the same time, donated dollars per person has risen by about 190%. So basically what he's saying is, the more Americans give, I, I don't read the rest of it because there's a little bit more, but basically the more Americans give, the more our, uh, the GDP grows. Now, that's, that seems against the grain, right? But it teaches us right here in the Bible that if we give, we gain. And it just, it's just awesome to me when people that are not believers get in line or, or prove that what the Bible says is true, whether they really want to or not. And so one of the ways to get wealthy is by giving, um, so if, I'll just read the last paragraph. He basically says this. Uh, the evidence is that increases in the GDP and giving mutually reinforce each other. Economic growth pushes up charitable giving, and charitable giving pushes up economic growth. Data from the Statistical Abstract of the United States and the Center on Phil Philanthropy at Indiana University provide examples. In 2004, $100 in extra income per American drove about $1.5. $1.47 in additional charitable giving per person. At the same time, $100 in giving stimulated more than $1,800 in increased GDP. This rate of social return shows that economic multiplier effects are not limited to private investments. In short, giving pays a positive role in American economic growth. It is a good investment for our country. Some might even go far as to say that donating to charity is a patriotic act.
And that's how he finishes his article. So it just kind of reinforces what the Bible says, right? That giving, the way to get wealth is by giving. What's it? Let's move on. Number two, the second way to get wealth, according to Proverbs, not according to Mark, but according to the Proverbs, is to work hard. Number two, to work hard. So what does Proverbs 10 and verse 4 say? Let's read it together. You want to? Well, let's read it together anyway, okay? <laughs> he who has a becomes poor, but the hand... All right. You know, I, I, I did some research into this too, and everybody said, nobody says, hey, man, you work hard, you, you get rich. In fact, they all try to dispute that. You're not supposed to work hard or you're supposed to work... See, you guys have heard the same thing. So, um, but I think the implication in the text is, is that you can't be lazy and expect to get rich, okay? And that's the implication in the text. And I would go even further to say that you can't get rich and try to, uh, you can't get rich through shortcuts either. Okay, so what would shortcuts be? Well, um, get rich quick schemes. That's a shortcut. You're trying to get rich, and you're trying to, you're trying to cut corners. Um, you, you know, lottery tickets is another one. I'm gonna, the average American spends $230 a year on lottery tickets. Probably be better to invest it or to give it right? or do something else with it. But, but um, the average American spends that amount of money. Why are we doing it? Because we want to be rich and not put in the work. Um, casinos, it's just, they're, they're, I'm going to read some statistics at the end that are just, uh, will blow you away, but let me just put, the house always wins, and casinos are making all kinds of money, okay? Um, so don't buy into, don't waste your money on things that just give you hope of riches, just go out and work hard. How about uh, pyramid schemes. You know, no good. Thank you for the thumbs down. No good, okay? Because we've all been sold it, right? You get somebody and you get... Just be careful about all that. Just go out and work hard. And that's just the best way, I think. Just don't be lazy. Laziness doesn't produce riches. You get rich by working hard. Number three, how do you get rich according to the book of Proverbs you listen to wise counsel. Listen to wise counsel. Proverbs 13, 8. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honored. So what happens when I disdain correction? It leads to poverty. That's one of the first things it says. Poverty and shame. I read an article this week by a guy who, who, was, not, who was himself somewhat wealthy, but he was not, uh, he was not as wealthy as, the, as his clients or people that he dealt with. And he wrote a blog article about the top 10 things that he finds in people that have great wealth. And it was amazing to me how many of the things that he listed link up with the things I'm talking about tonight. And one of the things that he said was, uh, I didn't copy his note, because it wasn't from a biblical perspective. This is just a guy who just wrote how to, how to, basically how to be rich, and, and what he found from kind of dealing with people. And one of the things he said is, is that people that are very wealthy listen to wise counsel. He said, when the wealthy and successful are unsure of a financial decision, they usually seek out financial advice from a professional export, expert and or they seek out the knowledge they need by educating themselves. He said this, the wealthy and successful are always learning. They read numerous books, they attend classes, uh, they read the paper and more. They do things, they're trying to educate themselves. And if I can speak from personal experience... I've always gotten into trouble financially when I did stuff without seeking advice. When I just thought that I could figure it out. And it's just, it's just good, in particular in the financial world, to actually get people that give you advice that know what they're talking about. 
And that's what basically Proverbs is saying. If I, if I try to go through life alone and, and I try to figure everything out on my own, it's just we're going to make a lot of mistakes. It's just better to get people that have already been down that road and have a lot of wisdom and have them guide us and have them help us and help, help us walk through difficult times. And that's in anything in life, but in particular when it comes and relates to finances. So listen to wise counsel. Number four, how do I get rich financially? Four, have a plan. Have a plan. So Proverbs 21.5 is, uh, is a great verse that kind of emphasizes that. Once again, these aren't my list. This is not my list. This is what the book of Proverbs says. So it says, the plans of the diligent leads surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty, surely to poverty. And then we've all heard, uh, we've all heard Proverbs 6, or most of us, if you've grown up in church at all, Proverbs 6 talks about the ant. Verse 6, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. So observe the ant, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. What's she doing? She's preparing for winter, right? She's preparing when there's no food. So how long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. So the implication is this. When it comes to our finances, we should have a plan. What does a plan look like? Well, a plan looks like a budget. So... What's your inflow? What's coming in? And how are you, uh, how is it going out? You know, tracking your money and knowing where it's going can help you see where you've wasted money and what spending habits need to be changed. And I just think that, um, you know, I think it's just wise to have a plan in all things in life. Like, let's have a plan. Let's have a goals we're shooting for. That's why I hear people really put down like New Year's resolutions, and I don't understand it. Because, look, it's, it's okay. So I miss 100% of the shots I don't take. And if I don't have any goals, then I'm just kind of wandering aimlessly. So it's okay to not make some goals, but just make some goals. Okay? And I just think that we, a lot of times, uh, we don't see any change in our life because we don't have a plan. We just, like, these are my goals. This is what I want to accomplish. Uh, you know, I know we joke about, well, I'm try- I need to lose weight, so I'm going to start this plan tomorrow. Tomorrow, it's a- Start it tomorrow. And then if you flop on Wednesday, then try again on Monday. But-, but have a plan. I think the worst thing we can do is just give up. So make resolutions, make changes, make new plans. People who explicitly make resolutions are 10 10 times more likely to attain their goals than people who don't explicitly make resolutions. So if I don't have anything to shoot for, I'm never going to hit it. I'm never going to accomplish it. And the same thing is true with my money. If, If I don't have a plan for my money, then just life dictates the plan. So I don't, if I don't have a plan for how much money I'm going to spend on eating out or how much money I'm going to spend on groceries or how much money I'm going to spend on this or that, then, man, life dictates that. And let me tell you something about life dictating how much food, how much money we spend on food. It's unlimited because it's always more convenient to eat out, right? It's always more convenient to go through the drive through It's always more, con- but you don't want to, your money telling you what to do. You want to tell your money what to do. So you need to have a plan. So have a plan for you. This is my in, income. This is my budget. This is what we want to do with our money. And this is not just a, a poor or middle income. Rich people do this too. They have a plan for their money. And this is, this is why people, um, you know, this is why rich people get rich is because they have a plan for it. So if you don't have a plan, then start with a simple thing. Like I, I think a simple, basic budget is give 10%, save 10%, and learn to live off the 80. I mean, if you don't have any plan, that's better than no plan. So have a plan and, 
And this is how people get rich. They have a plan. Their, their money is working for them. Number five, this is a big one. How do you get rich? Live within your means. Live within your means. Okay, what does Proverbs 21, 17 say? Let's read it together. Ready? He who loves will be a poor man. He who... Okay. This is funny to me because... It's funny to me because, one, I don't drink. I don't drink. My wife doesn't drink. But Karen's favorite line to me is, you have champagne taste on a beer income. (laughs) She loves to say that to me when I want to buy something. You have champagne taste on a beer income. Stop. Okay, and we have never had champagne, and we don't drink beer. But somehow that statement has lived in our house. What's the point? The point is, is that if, if I love pleasure, and I live for pleasure, it will suck up all my money. Here are some money statistics. 68% of people living live Paycheck to paycheck. 26% of Americans have no emergency saving. The average household in America has $7,283 in credit card debt. That's not, that's not home debt, that's credit card debt. And the reason for it is, is because we see something, we want it, we don't have the money to buy it, but we buy it anyway. Um, and the, the reason is, is that many people try to keep up with others and fall for what somebody calls lifestyle inflation, which can prevent you from being smart with your money. Look, if you make $50,000 a year, live within the $50,000. But the problem is, is most Americans do not. They they make $50,000, but they live on a $60,000 lifestyle. It always catches up with us. It always does. So rich, rich, riches come when we live within our means, when we're not stretched. We're not paying exorbitant interest on credit cards because we owe this money and we're just basically making credit card payments to keep up. You'll never, ever get ahead that way. You've got to learn to live within your means. And, and that's what basically the text is saying. If I live for pleasure, and so I do whatever I have to do to buy that car or buy that house or buy those clothes or buy those shoes and and I do it to keep up with the Joneses, it's just going to drown me and I'll never be rich. I'll die poor. So live within your means. Don't, Don't ever, ever go into credit card debt to buy stuff that is deteriorating in value. Just don't do it. Don't, look, don't buy shoes on credit card debt. Don't buy clothes on credit card debt. It's not worth, you can't get your money back. It's gone. When you go to garage sales, what are you doing? You're buying stuff pennies on the dollar for what it's worth, right? When it comes to clothes. Look, you may have designer clothes, but I ain't paying what you paid for them. Nobody does. So live within your means. And that's, that's what the text is implying. Don't love wine. and it doesn't, There's nothing wrong with wine. There's nothing wrong with oil. There's nothing wrong with it if you can afford it. But the average American can't afford it and they get it anyway. And it just cripples us. Number six, limit debt. Limit debt. How do, how do I, how do I, uh, how am I rich, how to be rich financially? Limit debt, okay? Proverbs 22, 7, you all have I've heard this. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Uh, you know, we, we, we have several people who teach the Dave Ramsey class and have gone through it. If you know anything about Dave Ramsey, Dave Ramsey doesn't, doesn't believe that you should have any debt, and the only debt that he sees as acceptable is a mortgage. 
And he says, if you have a mortgage, it should not be 25% greater. There should, it should not be any greater than 25% of your income. Uh, other economists say, you know, like for you to get a loan, if you go to a bank and you want to get a loan, they, they, they will give you a loan up to 43% of your gross income like on a mortgage. Most people say that 36% should be the rule. Whatever it is, you want to limit debt as much as is possible because when you're in debt, it consumes you. It's all you think about. You think about how to get out of it. And it just dominates your life. Our lives are not supposed to be dominated by how do I get out of debt. Our lives are supposed to be dominated by the leading of the Holy Spirit, God working in my life. What does God say? And so you want to limit your debt. And so, um, you know, I understand the, obviously the best case scenario for things would be to pay everything with cash, but there are times where I think debt is important and necessary, but you want to limit it as much as is possible. And that's kind of been our philosophy here at the church. We've very much tried to limit our debt. Um, the only things we borrow on are big things, which, such as when we built this building, we borrowed and, and, you know, we want to pay it off as quickly as possible. When we built that building up there, we did a 15-year note. We paid it off in nine years. We, we, we really needed to do the loan to get into a building. We were meeting in this little place, and we didn't, um, we needed space. So this is why we did that. We, we had to, in a sense, go into debt, or our growth was going to stymie. In the same way, that's why we got into this building. We had to go into debt to build this building because our growth was being stymied. We could not put any more people. If you were up there, you know what I'm talking about. It was, it was incredibly close and uncomfortable. And we just didn't have the space. So we had to build this building and we went into, uh, you know, we basically paid about a million dollars down to different things and we borrowed close uh, around two to get into this. And, you know, God's really blessed us here but, but it's reasonable debt. It's, it, it's not excessive debt. And I think in your life and in my life, we need to limit debt. Um, I don't stand up here casting any kind of stones. This is something that I've um, made mistakes with when I was younger. By the grace of God, we're in a good place financially now. But the, but the bigger point is, is I was not always like that, and I was, a, a lot of my life was swimming in debt, and it's not good. It's unhealthy, it's not good, and, and it has it uh, caused me a lot of pain. So, if I could just encourage you, limit your debt. Don't buy stuff on an impulse with credit card. Think about it. Give it some thought. Get some counsel. Get some advice. Ask your wife. She'll shoot you down. Or ask your husband. You know, he'll shoot you down. So limit debt. Number seven, the final one here. How do I get rich? Avoid destructive vices. Avoid destructive vices. Proverbs 23, 21. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man will clothe a man with rags it is amazing the amount of money that people spend on vices such as alcohol okay so we can all argue with the you know if i'm wasting money by going to a royals game but i will tell you this man going to a royals game and watching what people spend on alcohol blows my mind you know, a beer at Royal Stadium is like 12 bucks for a can. Now, it's a big can, but it's 12 bucks. And they're, they're making waves, actually. The Royals are actually making waves this year because they have lowered. They have certain con concession stands in the stadium now where they have lowered the cost of a beer from $12 to $5. Doesn't still seem like much of a bargain to me, right? Okay. But it is, you'll go to a game, man, and people will just buy the beers and buy the beers and buy the beers, and you just watch people just, and hey, I got the row. What? what? I mean, that's like a hundred bucks. 
If you have three drinks a day, like if, you're, if you drink a lot of alcohol, you have three drinks a day, five days a week, and an average of $10 a pop, you're spending $150 a week, $650 a month, and $7,800 a year just on alcohol. That's a lot of money. Not including any additional costs like server tips or taking a taxi instead of driving. Even if you drink only on weekends at two, two, two drinks per day, you are still spending $2,500 a year. You say, I don't drink alcohol, I drink wine, okay? Um, <laughs> the cost of a bottle of white wine averages $14.41, while an average bottle of red wine costs $15.66. If you drink one each, each per week for a year, that's more than $1,563. Um, drinking is between you and God, but I'm going to tell you, it, it, it sucks in a lot of people and a lot of money goes to it. Gambling is another one. The, in, in, 23, in 2013, the 23 Vegas casinos brought in $72 million each year. That year, they brought in $72 million per casino. They ended up with over $5 billion of their visitors' money. That's an average of $630,000 a day that Americans gave to casinos. Okay? Vices like these will destroy you financially. It will break you financially. And that's what he's saying. The drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe the man with rags. So if I'm lazy and I never work and I eat and drink all the time, I'm not going to have a lot to show for it. And one of the greatest things that I can do for my children is not to leave them in a financial pinch, but to leave them in a good spot financially. That's one of my goals. Like I don't, I don't want to die and my kids go, you see how much debt dad's got? I want to die and my kids are set up and they can do whatever they want with it. I, uh, the Bible talks about that, setting up the next generation. Don't leave them financially pinched and in, and, and in a lot of debt and wondering how they're going to pay your bills off. Work hard to put yourself in a good situation so that your kids are in a good spot place when you die. Now, I don't want to be in such a good place that I want my children want me dead, but I, I want to, <laughs> right? I hope they kind of still want me around, but I also want them to be in a good place financially where it's not, I, I, my death is not a financial burden to them. And I cannot tell you the amount of people that I deal with on a yearly basis who, who their parents have died and they're in a world of hurt. Because dad, I mean, I, I remember one person just came in recently and found out that uh, his mother had all of these credit cards debts and had run them all up. And just, it was a mess. So, you know, make sure when you die, you, your kids are in a good spot. And that's, and, and I think you can do that if you avoid just some destructive vices. The bottle, alcohol, well, drugs, they'll suck up your money. They'll destroy you. And there, there are these vices that will bring us down. So I know super-duper basic stuff, but maybe good reminders for us, right? How do we get rich? By giving, by working hard, by listening to wise counsel, by having a plan, by living within our means, by limiting debt and by avoiding destructive vices. These are some great things that we can kind of follow no matter how old we are uh, and as we go forward financially to do the right thing, okay?